Professor Smith, this is our second interview. The first was on the 19th of January when we spoke of your life and your career and your first term in the Goodhart Chair. Today, could we concentrate on your scholarly work? But before we do that, just spend a short time rounding up some aspects of the Goodhart mm -hmm. tenure, namely your teaching and your research activities. So turning to these, I wonder if we could just summarise your teaching activities during the Lent and Easter, mm -hmm. the courses you did and how mm. things went. Yes. Um, well, I was involved in the uh, public law course, which is a seminar uh, course, um, and that meant, I mean, in, in the first uh, term the students selected what, what it was they were going to write about and then had a fair amount of instruction in how to go about writing a dissertation. Um, and then in the second term, they uh, came and individually presented their papers. Um, and that was very interesting. Um, all kinds of um, very different insights that were brought to bear. Quite a number of the students were Australian, but there was a Swiss person and, an, Aus and a, an Irish person, and um, they brought various you know, aspects of comparative public law to bear on what they were doing. It was all very interesting. Yeah. Uh, in your first interview, you mentioned that apropos the research that you hoped to conduct, you were going to hope you hopefully were going to look at Arthur Goodhart himself. Yes. And I wondered whether um, you had managed to uh, pursue this, and if so, whether you were able to share some of your findings with us. Um, up, up to a point, what I did discover was that there's quite a large archive in the in the, um, the Bodleian in Oxford. Of his papers, and um, I think if anybody were going to be doing any serious work on him, sometime looking at those might be a, um, a way forward. And in fact, I hope to be able to do that myself. I'm going to be in Oxford for three or four days in September, and I was going to look up um, some some of the things, some of the uh, uh, matters that he was interested in. I think. Um, he was, he was a slightly unusual man in the sense that I think he, he, he was very good at nurturing friendships with um, senior judges and, um, and he was, in various ways he was quite an influential figure and it'd be nice to follow up on that a bit. His, his son, one of his sons, um, wrote an excellent appreciation of him which was delivered at a, lect a lecture at the London School of Economics and I think he, he then wrote that lecture up a bit so it was quite a good account of his life and why he was a, a, an American, of course, and so the question arose as to why he chose to spend all his life pretty well in, in the United Kingdom rather than America. Yes. So, yes. Um, and the son does give some insights into that, not necessarily to the advantage of, uh, of his family, if I could put it like <laughs> that. <laughs> um, yes. Um, so, so there was that aspect of it. The other thing I wanted to do was to see if we could get some degree of continuity between the um, outgoing professors, if you like, and the and the incoming ones. And I've certainly been in touch with Sir John Laws, who was the who was my successor, and spoken to him about what I think the thing the, the role entails and what he might like to bring to it. I mean, he, he will have his own ideas, being who he is. But yes. yes. Um, and any other research opportunities that may have arisen? Well, um, yes, up to a point. I gave a paper at one of the um, public law seminars. I haven't had time to write that up. Um, and the teaching was quite um, time consuming, um, particularly the legislation course, um, which I was doing with um, David Feldman. And um, David, I'm very pleased to say is going to, to present it again next year. There was a new initiative for, um, for Cambridge to do this course and uh, he and I both did quite a lot of work on it um, and uh, I'm pleased that he's actually you know, following it through. Um, I'm pleased that he's not wasted his time, well not wasted but um, not been able to make quite as constructive a use of all the work that he has done, so that's that, that I'm very pleased about. Mm. It's very interesting. Mm. Mm. So that's a new course in the Tripos? No, it's an MLN course. An course. course. Yes, right. yes. I um, should be interested to see how that's presented on the uh, MLN website. Yes, yes. 
Um, I think quite a lot of the members of the class actually came to your presentation on research methods in the library and so forth. Quite a lot of those, the same students who were in the legislation class were also in the public law class. And so um, I think they all got a lot out of that particular session, the session you did with them. Thank you very much. Hmm. Um, Professor Smith, that brings us then to the main part of this conversation, hmm. and that is your scholarly work. Right. And uh, you, of course, have a very long, illustrious publication like record, mm. going back to the 1970s during your, your time at Christchurch, uh, when you were an assistant lecturer. Mm. Uh, but, of course, time being finite, um, we're only going to concentrate on your four major textbooks this right. morning, yeah. and then two articles which are, have strong links to the themes which seem to have occupied your mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, as a background, uh, I wonder just to put this in context, and it would be fascinating for us to know, um, if you could just outline your interest in criminality and how your ideas and your, and your, your, um, your attitudes on the subject have evolved over the years. Mm -hmm. um. I think what's happened over the years, uh, I was always interested in, in, in the criminal law context and the relationship between the individual and the state. And of course, in criminal law, the individual is at most risk, um, at most peril of being imprisoned or, you know, when I started, um, it was the death penalty. Um, and and um, so it had very serious consequences. What's evolved, I think, in my, in my thinking is that I want or have um, seen or tried to make more explicit the relationship between the criminal law and the criminal justice process and the constitutional context in which it finds itself. And so increasingly I've seen criminal law as being a branch of public law. Now that was certainly not a perception when I started teaching in 1970, 1970 I think. Um, you know, we had criminal law here and we have public law or constitutional law over here and there was no crossover between the two. Um, now the Americans um, did have a crossover between the two because aspects of their criminal justice process were actually in their constitution. And so you know, um, the privilege against self-incrimination, for example, there it is in the constitution. Um, Britain, the United Kingdom, so the United Kingdom and New Zealand don't have an articulated constitution of that kind, but um, but you see the crossover between constitutional public law and criminal law. And so when I was here in the previous incarnation, my title was actually the Professor of Criminal and Public Laws. So that's the great de development I would have said. Um, the great is probably the wrong word you used to describe it, but that is the, the, the focus, and that's been an evolving focus of it. And um, uh, so, I mean, there were articles, for example, on judicial law making in the criminal law, the extent to which the judges were free to develop the criminal law. I was always very um, cautious about that. Um, and so, again, quite a lot of my thinking had been about the case for a criminal code having it all written down in advance and not having the judges making it up as, as they go along. And so most, most common law countries, including New Zealand and much of Australia and the United States, they all have criminal codes. This country still doesn't. Um, so I'm, uh, one of my major articles, I think, was the case for a code. Um, and to a certain extent, you get it in, the, in those works too, in the, in the public. The, the, um, public order book and then the theft book and then even more explicitly in the contempt book because contempt is a is a is a, is a common law wrong not in statutory form so the judges do continue to develop it um, for example quite recently by saying that jurors who um, contrary to their instructions go online to look at the cases they're about to try Committing a bit of interfering with the administration of justice and committing a criminal offence. Um, I find that problematic um, because it's not laid down in advance that that's something they're not supposed to do, other than in very general terms. Um, 
and not long after the judges did that, Parliament enacted legislation as it were confirming that that's what they thought was, a, was an appropriate way of dealing with the problems we had there. Um, but I didn't like the fact that it's the judges who made the decision in the first place. Um, although, obviously, the <coughs> custodians of the of the justice process, I suppose, and when you when they see what they believe to be people interfering with it. And it's perfectly true to say that the notion of contempt involves interfering with the administration of justice. And uh, if it crystallises out into a specific criminal offence, um, I suppose there's no great harm done, but I think constitutionally it's not the best way of dealing with it. That is very interesting indeed. Mm. Thank you. Um, which then brings us to your first major book, which is the Offences Against Public Order, yes. including the Public Order Act. Yes. Published the year after you became professor at Reading mm. in 1986. Mm. Um, and I wondered if you could just outline the development of your ideas on this topic, which must have began while you were in Durham in the early 80s. Yes. Um, yes, although... Um, I'd had an interest in public order law for quite a long time. Um, in New Zealand we had um, legislation which criminalised um, disorderly conduct um, and that was used in the, against the protesters in the Vietnam demonstrations in New Zealand in the late 60s, um, New Zealand having been a military participant in that war. And um, it always used to offend me that um, the way in which the judges dealt with it at that stage was merely to say, well, disorderly means disorderly and we can't paraphrase it, but what you did was disorderly and therefore that's a criminal offence, um, without sort of explaining why, or having any kind of um, apparatus with which to balance the aspirations of the protesters, their right to freedom of speech, those kinds of things, weren't part of the mix at all. They, did, they just more or less said, well, Parliament says it's an offence to behave in a way that's disorderly. This was disorderly. That must be a criminal offence. The end. And people who tried to lecture the judges um, on the rights to freedom of speech got very, very short shrift. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the judges had been fighting in the Second World War. And they didn't want young barristers giving them lectures on the rights to freedom of speech. Thank you very much. Mm. Um, so uh, I always thought that was a very unsatisfactory framework in which to be trying to work out, you know, these the, the balances you you have to get between um, the conflicting um, interests that are at stake when you get public demonstrations. And so forth. Yeah. So I, it, it had been an interest of mine for quite a long time. Yes. You didn't think it necessary to write a second edition. <laughs> The trouble with second editions is that they're extremely boring to write. The interesting thing is to do, do it the first time round, and then very often all you're doing is, is subsequently is looking at cases and possibly legislation that's been um, generated since, and um, it's just not as much fun. You don't, you, you're not having to rethink a framework, um, which would or think a framework, which is what that I mean that book required to a certain extent. The Public Order Act. It did um, create a framework of its own which I could work around, but there's a great deal more to the act than just just the criminal law. Um, quite a lot of it's to do with police powers in relation to processions and, and assemblies and so forth. Um, but uh, funny enough, um, I, I, I came to this country to work with Landon Williams, and Landon had been contracted to do by the publishers a four volume series of books. The first one was Criminal Law of the General Power, which he wrote in 1953-4, and then he did do a second edition of that. And then he was always going to write one on property offences, and one on public order, and one on offences against the person. That, that was his grand plan. And so when I first met him, he said, well, um, why don't you write a book with me, and which is how that one came to be um, to be generated, really. Um, but perhaps so the seed in your mind for a book on 
company. Yes, yeah. as well. That's yes. right, because it was clear that he wasn't going to do it. He, he had got more and more um, preoccupied with the, the enactment of the criminal code. That was one of his great missions. And funny enough, I had correspondence just in the last week or so with Sir Richard Buxton, who had been, been at the Law Commission when Glanville was working on this. And he told me that Glanville actually had written the whole code, and, and Richard had a, a copy of it, but he's lost it. <laughs> um, uh, and so, and the other great change, I think, was that Glanville was one of the first people that I know to start using a computer. Um, and so when we first started that book, it was very frustrating because I would write a draft of a chapter and give it to him. He was often so busy, he didn't have time to look at it. And then three months later, we'd have a meeting and he would have chopped my work up into bits and pieces. And of course, I couldn't remember what the thing looked like in the first place. Um, so that, you know, having computers made that a great deal of them easier. Yes. Yep. With the uh, passage of the Act, the, yes. uh, the Public Order Act, um, it obviously exercised the minds of quite a few academics. Yes. And uh, there were, in fact, four academics who wrote reviews. Yes. Um, of, there were four books, actually. Four books, came right. Books were, yeah. by, um, just for the benefit of the listeners, Card, Marston, yourself, and Thornton. And oh. two of the reviewers actually lumped these books together in mm -hmm. one review. Yes. And Bonner and Edwards, <coughs> considering all four, considered that yours was the best. And Bonner was particularly praising. He, he said it was a tour de force and that it will be a Bible. Mm. And I thought, you know, this mm -hmm. must have been incredibly gratifying at that point of your career. Yes. Yes. Actually, Sir David Williams wrote a review of it too in the Cambridge Law Journal. Which was, very, which was a very kind review. Um, of course, that was very much his, his field. Um, and Peter Thornton is now the the nation's uh, chief coroner. I see. Um, but he was quite active in the National Council for Civil Liberties, and he wrote from that that perspective. I know him reasonably well too. Um, but uh, to about that review um, by David Williams. Mm. Uh, in the previous interview, you mentioned. Um, the uh, was it Thornton who's become chief coroner? Yes. You you collaborated uh, with P. A. J. Waddington, yep. who'd been ex policeman. Tank, his name, Tank Waddington. He was six foot six. <laughs> <laughs> mm. uh, do, do you think this could have given you a bit of an edge? Oh yes. Had that? Yes, yes. He was a, he, not only was he an ex policeman, but he um, his work was on sociology of policing. And he was very interested in um, the control of demonstrations. His other, um, where he had a major influence, was on um, police use of firearms. Um, he was the first person in this country to say, we should have specially trained firearms um, squads and specially trained officers to, to control them. Because what tended to happen is when you, we had a, a firearms incident, incident, the people who were being trained as, as experts were often you know, constables, sergeants and so forth, and they would go to a, an incident and a, a much more senior policeman would turn up and start telling them what to do. Um, well, they didn't know what to do. The people who knew what to do were the sergeants and the, the constables, and so he said, you know, we really need to coordinate that, um, that sort of training, and that's what they ultimately did. And one of his friends, um, there was a man called Peter Imbert, Sir Peter Imbert, as he became, I think he's now Lord Imbert, who was the the um, Metropolitan Police Commissioner. And um, Tank managed to persuade him to allow Tank to go to the, way the, 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 the planning meetings which the police had to start implementing this Public Order Act. And so he went to every single major meeting that they had on how to do it. Um, and I think he was giving a certain amount of advice too as to how the, um, the policing role should be coordinated. Um, 
And Nears was very, very, very useful to be able to talk to him what the police fears were. Actually, uh, the, 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 some of the most frightening things the police had to coordinate were things like um, uh, New Year's Eve in Trafalgar Square. Absolutely terrifying for the police um, because, you know, crowds can be extremely dangerous entities. And um, of course, people just having fun and probably a certain amount of alcohol around the place and they were terrified that, you know, one of these days something was going to go very badly wrong. Yes. Yeah, that when, you know, hills were and things like that, you see how dangerous crowds can be. Yes. Mm. So, yes, it was extremely useful to be able to talk to him um, um, about how all of this was, was going to work and how it ultimately did work. Mm. Which brings us then to a few specific points. Um, and on page 10 in this book, the uh, Fences Against the Public Order on the Right to Demonstrate, the common law doesn't protect rights, mm. but the Act, of course, protected public order. Mm. Um, that was the case when your book appeared. Do you think that the Convention and the Human Rights Act have perhaps leveled the playing field mm, as yes regard to free speech? Yes, I do. Um, and I think it's given the judges, the courts, a framework within which they can have a look at the various interests. Just as I was talking about earlier when I said in New Zealand we didn't have any, any kind of framework to enable this analysis to take place. Yes, these days you do. Um, and it's quite clear that the right to freedom of expression, the right to assembly, are both guaranteed. Now, of course, they're still not absolute, but at least these days you get a sense, you know, um, uh, that the judges are much more alive to the, the civil liberty and implications of stopping people from saying what they, what they want to say. Yes, much more. And you get people like Stephen Sedley, Lord Justice Sedley, saying, you know, freedom to speak only inoffensively is not really freedom of speech at all. You could be allowed to say things that other people don't like very much. Um, yes. They don't always get it right, but um, yes. yes. Do, do you think, Professor Smith, that with Brexit there could be further modifications? I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know to what extent, um, I mean, the, the European Convention, of course, has got nothing to do with, with Brexit or the European, so as, as far as I'm aware, that will continue to have a major influence on the way in which um, matters are litigated in this country, so it sh shouldn't make any real difference, no, yeah. no. Mm. Um, another point on page 15, yeah, as things stood in 1987, you could act lawfully, but still be arrested for not stopping if the audience takes to violence or threatens yes, to yes. Uh, Duncan and Jones in 1936. That's right. And the Act didn't change that. Um, you, you, one could see this as perhaps a license to opposing groups to stifle free speech. It, yes. And you actually say it gives the police an enormous amount of discretion. Yes. Do you think the situation has changed since your book? Um, the Human Rights Act? Never so slightly, perhaps. Um, I think that the police are aware that if um, if they do force people to desist from speaking, um, that does confer what's known as a heckler's veto on the on the and the other protesters. So I think the police will do as much as they can to allow you know the the conflicting views to be aired. Um, but there have been occasions where I mean the police have no power um, to stop people as such from demonstrating the no license to you know hold a demonstration as there is in Hong Kong or Singapore or quite a lot of these other places um, so um, I, I think there's a much greater awareness of the issues that are at stake put it that way when, when the policing of demonstrations happens um, but again they don't always get it wrong I mean the, um, the right rather the um, the protests in um, uh, wasn't May Day, it was the Oxford Circus protest when the police used the so called kettling powers. Um, I just sort of holding absolutely everybody in one in place and then letting them, releasing them only bit, bit by bit. Well, that was held to be in breach of the European Convention, what they were doing on that particular occasion. 
So, no, they don't always get it right. As I say, I think often they're frightened or terribly worried that people are going to get killed in these demonstrations. And what happened um, on that occasion was that the, um, the demonstration was advertised by Twitter and so forth, and it was suggested that people should um, converge on Oxford Circus from four different directions. And so the police were having to you know, control a demonstration that was coming to what was going to be you know, a focal point and doing a huge number stuck in Oxford Circus with those kind of forces coming at it. Yes. It was something I think they, they found pretty terrifying. So that's, yes. what, that's what they did. They threw a cordon around Oxford Circus. Anybody who was in it, they just kept them there and let them disperse bit by bit by bit. By bit. It took about eight hours to disperse. And that was the article that you wrote in 2008. So revisiting this some 21 years later. Um, and uh, it seemed to me that article, in a way, to some extent, represented a distillation of your observations, if you like, of the application of that act over that period. Right. Yes, that's probably right. Mm. Very interesting. Mm. But still, on the subject of this book, there's just one other point. Um, you said uh, on page 20 that there's a danger that the law will generate oppressive piecing, and that was in regard to the change to the Act which allowed the police to operate on perceptions, you know, rather than hard facts, for example, um, they could uh, impose in advance conditions on marches yes. uh, to prevent serious disruption yes. to the life of the community. Yes. Do, you th do you think you know, that your prediction has manifested itself? No, I don't think so. I think that um, they don't do that. Um, what Waddington's early experience showed was that they didn't want to use those powers. Much better to the way in which they actually did it was much more clever. I mean, they would negotiate with the um, the organisers of these um, meetings and the uh, uh, processions and assembly. And very often what they would say is, well, you can do what you propose to do, but we could make it a great deal easier for you if you just do this, just do, do this. In other words, they're controlling the ground. That's really what they're doing. And they were just saying, look, it's going to be, um, you know, you people yourselves We'll have stewards controlling the demonstrations. It would be much easier for them if you do it our way, and we can put you in a, you know this space, and we can allow you to do this, and we'll block off half the road. So that was that was the work that um, Waddington was doing. Right. Mm. Very interesting. Yeah. I think that this problem exercised the mind of Boris Johnson when he was the mayor of London, <laughs> and he considered introducing measures which seemed on the surface fairly draconian, but. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you consider the problems. Three nearly new water cannons, wasn't it? That's <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. mm. <laughs> of course, the Home Secretary is the one who ultimately says whether or not those measures can be, can be used. Right. We've got, we had the same thing in, in Newcastle when um, uh, the Home Office wanted to start using uh, plastic bullets as a way of controlling crowds. And the councils in, well, in Newcastle, and I think some of the other northern local authorities did not want that, and it, had, it went to the courts. And the question was whether or not the view of the Home Secretary, who after all was providing the funding for the, these control measures, or the view of the local authority was going to prevail. The courts had no difficulty in saying no, it's the Home Secretary, um, which um, put put control of public order in the hands of the police again, rather than the, you know, rather than the local perceptions of it. Right. Mm. Uh, Professor Smith, that brings us to your second book. Uh, you were back at Cambridge and you produced Property Offences, the Protection of Property Through the Criminal Law. Yes. And in the preface, uh, it actually comments on the very complicated stages that this book went through in the <laughs> writing. Mm. And I wondered if you could just tell us about that. It started off as a joint venture with Glenville Williams. Yes, that's right. Um, in 19, and funny enough, I'd originally come to Cambridge to work with Glenville, and I wasn't terribly clear which area I was going to work in. But I did start on contempt of court as a possible PhD about six months after I started working on that. We learned that Lord Borry was writing a book on it. And so I, I moved away from it. And Glanville said at that stage, well, you know, I'd quite love 
the Theft Act is a quite recent enactment. It was 1972. The Theft Act was 68. There's one book on it. Well, there were two books on it. Um, but we were going to go much wider than the Theft Act. We were going to do property offences completely. Um, and uh, so that, that gave us quite a lot of scope to write a, a different sort of book. And for a while, Glandall was was involved in it, but then ultimately, again, his preoccupation with the code um, and his work with the Law Commission and so forth, that, that he, he, he was very explicit about it. He said, that has to be my highest priority. Um, and he had a feeling, I think, that his time was getting short and he really wanted to, to get this measure um, off the ground and, and actually onto the statute book. didn't happen. Um, uh, so eventually, he said, you know, why don't you finish it yourself? Which I did, and at, at, by that time, um, computers were a sort of an everyday event, and it just made for like, producing of that just so much simpler and finish. Nevertheless, did you find it quite difficult to maintain your momentum, given that it spanned such a considerable period? Oh, yes, considerable yes. Period? No, it would keep being put away and then got out again, and yes. Um, uh, and I can't remember whether I actually took leave to finish it or not, um, because I was, I, I don't think I did probably, um, because as you say, I finished it when I came back from Reading, um, and uh, well, it was a lecturer, and then reader, and then professor. Um, I don't remember having much leave to do it. But, mm, mm. So you mentioned in the preface, um, on the topic of the book's long gestation, um, you cite Hayek. On this, oh, yes. the rapidly decreasing returns. Yes. Very interesting quote. It um, is. For extra effort put into a work once it's completed, as he, as he to quote him, a tolerably finished product. Mm, that's right. And presumably mm. this is how you felt it, eventually. It, you, it's, you, it's how you have to feel. Yes, that's right. Yes. I think it's how you have to feel. And um, it would always be my advice to young scholars too. Yes, you can tweak it and work with it and so forth, but you're probably not going to improve it a great deal, and um, any book that's going to have flaws, um, you've got to eradicate them as best you can, but thinking you, it's worthwhile spending time rephrasing and so forth, it's not, <laughs> I don't think. Mm. Um, coming then to some of the reviews, one in particular by Paul Roberts at Nottingham, mm. in book here with you, he said that you argue for, and I quote, thoroughgoing reappraisal of our basic scheme property offences, especially in view of the revolution in plastic money and mm -hmm. cyberspace. Mm -hmm. um, has this happened in the interview? Yes, up to a point, I would say. Um, but when it crucially mattered, um, I don't think that the judges understood the, the, the change that had been made by the Theft Act. Um, it's, a, it's a technical question, but the law prior to the Theft Act of Lord Larceny um, was based on the idea that criminal law protected the possession of, 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 a, of a thing, not ownership. So although when somebody took something of yours, actually they were violating your rights of ownership, it was all done on the technicality that they were also taking your possession. Um, and the whole point of the Theft Act was to say we're going to move the basis of protection from possession to ownership. Um, and that means um, that if I own something, um, then it'll be rare that I'm actually guilty of stealing it, if it's actually mine. If I've actually lent it to somebody or, let's say, pawned it and given somebody a better right to possess it than I've got in the, for the time being, um, I may still commit an offence by interfering with that person's possession because that is a greater right even than my rights of ownership in that sort of situation. But it's, um, the, the issue went to the House of Lords on four different occasions, I think, um, whether you can appropriate property uh, when it actually becomes yours in the course of the transaction that's alleged to constitute theft. Now, the, the framers of the Theft Act would have said it's not supposed to. The criminal law is there to protect ownership, and if you've got ownership, or you become, if the civil law says you have become the, the valid owner of it, then 
the course of that transaction, then it shouldn't be theft. But um, the House of Lords disagree. And as I say, I just don't think they they ever really got their heads around the, this whole notion. Interesting. Mm. Uh, well, Roberts said he hoped that you'd bring out new additions to cope with the Criminal Justice and the Public Order Act. Yeah. Um, but perhaps this wasn't a priority. No. Yeah. No, and again, it's the end of the old problem. Um, it's not as much fun doing the election. No, it really isn't. Mm. Well, mm. I guess this is what that brings us then to your the third work, which we're going to talk about today, which is your harm and Hand culpability. culpability. Yes. And this coincided with your chair at Cambridge. It was an edited volume yeah. based on a series of seminars given in Cambridge in '94. Twelve authors, four of which were at Cambridge. And I wondered if you could just outline the circumstances of this lecture series. Yes. Who the book was primarily aimed at? Primarily aimed at other scholars, I would say. Um, uh, there uh, have been very little um, thinking about wider questions about criminal responsibility um, that moved away from considering the case law. Um, was a part of the, the English tradition, if I could put it that way. I had always been interested in, for quite a while, criminal theory um, emanating from places like Germany. Um, and Ashworth, who was one of the one of the writers in that, and I, for example, went to a, a two-week seminar in Freiburg and Reisgau on Germans theorising about the criminal law, and that was that was given a, a very significant shot in the arm by a man called George Fletcher, uh, an American, who wrote a book called Rethinking Criminal Law. And he was, he was rethinking theories about criminal responsibility. And I remember when I was first arguing about it with John, Sir John Smith and Glanville Williams, um, they couldn't quite see the point of what it was that Fletcher was trying to do. Um, for example, Fletcher reinvigorated thinking about the distinction between justification and excuse. Now, the common lawyers, going back to Sir James, Fitzjames Stephen, would just say, well, it doesn't matter whether it's a justification or an excuse, because either way, if the plea that it was justified or excused succeeds, then the person's not guilty, and so who cares whether it's justification or excuse? And Fletcher explained why you might care all sorts of consequences that turn on, as the German theory had been doing for years, um, and so justification and excuse became part of our way of looking at things too. And so the, the seminar um, we had here in Cambridge, we had um, Andrew Sinister, um, who was a research fellow at Keys at the time, working on these problems of, of criminal responsibility, and Andrew von Hirsch, a uh, German. Quite familiar with German um, theory, and so I suggested that, as you say, we, we'd have a series of seminars and just invite people we wanted to invite. And so they came about once a fortnight, and everybody else actually came to the most of the seminars. Um, and then, after all the papers had been delivered, we had a two or three day conference here, which all the papers were um, looked at again. A lot of the people who presented their papers rewrote them in the light of comments that they'd got at the seminar itself, but they re-submitted their papers. Um, and then we had, a, as I say, a two or three day seminar at which people went over it again and argued with it again, and uh, that meant we had a coherent um, set of papers for a, for a book, and then um, Sinister and I edited those. And, uh, it's still cited a lot. Quite often by the people who wrote the papers, but anyway, um, it is cited quite a lot. Mm. Um, you, your own participation, um, in addition to the editing, was the introductory chapter of yes, the with Andrew, yes. Criminalisation and the Road of Theory. Yes. And you say, one cannot answer legal questions in a theoretical vacuum, one needs an understanding of the doctrines and the principles which explain them. Was 
legal theory, one of your research or your teaching specialities at Cambridge? Um, not at Cambridge. I, 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 I did a paper in jurisprudence and legal theory um, for my master's degree. Um, but I would not have written about it um, in, in the same way as some of these other people were writing about it. I have been interested in it, yes, as I say, that seminar in... Actually, I did write a paper for that seminar in, in Germany, that's right, on mistake of law, um, which is quite a widely cited paper. Um, and uh, that's probably the, the closest I've got to spending a good amount of time on, on pure criminal law theory, if you like. Yeah. Um, there's an intriguing sentence, the last sentence on page three, and I quote, to generate legal theory that's not grounded in the system we have is to generate theory about someone else's legal system. And I wondered whether common law lawyers thinking about EU law would be an example of this. Mm, I think so. Um, but as I say, uh, uh, I was particularly influenced, and I think Ash, um, Ashworth and von Hirsch by the German legal system rather than, rather than an EU system. Um, other people, I think John Spencer, for example, were interested in French way of looking at things. But again, you know, both of these countries have got criminal codes. The, the France's case is a Napoleonic code, yes. and we never quite got around to it. It's just a very really un-English way of looking at things. So, do you think, Professor Smith, that in light of Brexit, Brexit, there will be some changes? I don't think so. Um, uh, I mean, there will be changes to the criminal justice system because a lot of the um, relations with EU and criminal law matters are a matter of quite highly developed um, jurisdiction collaborations. In fact, I, I chaired a, um, a seminar in London about six weeks ago before the, before the vote, and I was attended by a lot of the civil servants from the Home Office and the various um, agencies that do do um, a lot of the nuts and bolts criminal detection and so forth. And they were horrified at the prospect. They said that there were just not anything like enough of this to be able to cope if, if we leave. And you know, what they're it, saying is absolutely being drawn up. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it's not quite as bad as the, um, the problem with um, uh, trade negotiations, but um, uh, having to put in place different arrangements for what's to do about um, uh, extraditing and all that sort of thing. It could almost never it could revert to the original common law. It would simply I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Um, but, but how that's going to be dealt with is something that you know, um, the last people are starting to turn their attention to. But it was quick, quite clear that none of the implications of that seemed to be apparent to the politicians who were driving this, uh, yeah. the, the desire to get out. Yes. Yeah. Mm. You discuss the subjective, objective debate in criminal law. And you say that it affects so many other areas of black letter criminal law, and that the objective view in 1996 carried the day. In the last 20 years, has this remained the case? Um, yes, I'd say, I would, I would say it, it has, yes. Um, uh, we switch between, or have switched between, a subjective view of accountability. That was the predominant academic way of looking, I think, particularly Glanville Williams and John Smith, um, to a lesser extent Herbert Hart. Um, the courts have been less willing to um, comply with that, although it's fair to say that they, the leading case pro-objectivity um, was a case called Caldwell, decided in 1982, and that was actually reversed by the House of Lords eventually. So um, to that extent, I think possibly the courts did ultimately listen. And that was Lord Bingham who um, took the 
charge in a case called Elwin, I think, but just just a single letter. Um, but he said it has been subject to so much criticism. It works on fairness. Um, when judges are confronted with having to, to treat people who weren't aware of what their conduct was was likely to, to lead to, and they just don't like having to do it, you might as well just say it's wrong. Yes, yeah, so that, that would be one. Certainly, one very important. Um, I can actually. If, but no, it's a case called G. That's right. G. I'm, I'm certain it is. G. G. Just G. Um, it was just a single letter. It was a, a young person, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a young person. I think of about fourteen, and he clearly, he, he or she didn't understand the implications of what they were doing, um, and all the would have said, "Too bad, you've got to convict them anyway." And, well, I, you know, just can't do that. So, yes. It's like a veritable thicket. Yes, it is. <laughs> mm. uh, in a review by Barbara Hudson, who at the time was a sociologist at Northumbria and now a professor at Central Lancashire, mm. she said that these essays could be seen, I quote, as part of a trend to replace the case law tradition with a clearer enunciation of principles and their applicability. Yeah. Part of the same trend to reduction of judicial discretion by the move towards mandatory sentencing. Was this the case for Peter Smith? And if yes, do you think this trend has continued? Yes, I think so. Um, do you think it's a good thing? Yes. Um, yes, what, what, um, what Sinister and Sullivan in their book and to a lesser extent Ashworth in his book um, on criminal law uh, talk about principles, um, whereas prior to that, um, the leading books were very, very case oriented. This is what the judges decided, this is the implications of what the judges decided, without a wider view of the, you know, the, the principled context in which to place it. And um, Ashworth, uh, just as a homely example of that, when we were at this conference in, um, in Freiburg, um, we had the mornings free, and he would go off to the swimming pool with a, with a pad and a, a pencil, and he would write his book on criminal law. And I said, well, how do you do that? And he, when you haven't got the cases, he said, well, the, the trouble is the cases just confuse you, just get in the road, so take no notice of them. <laughs> <laughs> did, did he write in between lengths? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I don't know how he did it, but uh, yes. Um, you know, you'd have a swim and then get up and write some more. And you know his book, Principles of Criminal Law, was actually called Principles of Criminal Law, and that's a major text these days. And it stands in contrast to the old works of Smith and Hogan, which are very, still very, very case based. Right. Very interesting. Um, Peter Smith was born in 
and drawn it out in time for the, the publication, and it was it was penned by the by the reviewers, I'm afraid, <laughs> particularly a man called Graham Zellick, who, who wrote a review of it, um, saying, um, "Don't these people realise that?" Academics have actually written quite a lot about this because there was no reference to the academic work. And so when they came to write a second edition, they were casting around for an academic and they asked John Spencer if he would like to do it. And John, because John and, and David Eady had sat together on a committee on privacy, so they knew one another. That's why. But Spencer said he didn't have time, but he said I might like to be involved. And I think he knew I had a, an old interest in contempt. Um, so I said I would, and so that's how I got involved in it, and it's been a really fruitful um, exercise, really. Um, Edie and I just wrote it together. Um, Arledge didn't contribute at all to the second edition. He came, he came to Cambridge for one afternoon, that was it, really. And he decided that the decision of the House of Lords in the Sunday Times case was per and curiam. Well, the House of Lords can't make a decision per and curiam, <laughs> so he didn't tell him that. Um, but then he and I wrote it um, together, more or less word for word. He would come over to Cambridge, he lives in Kent, so he would leave Cambridge, sorry Kent, at about half five in the morning, get over here and we'd work a weekend on it, weekend after weekend really. And we would do it line by line, and then we would do it over the phone and so forth. And it was quite a major piece of work actually. And there were three editions in rapid succession. Yes, but it's very changing, um, and we're, we're nearly, I mean, I've got two chapters of the new edition to be working on right now, um, and again, it's not fun, right. but, um, uh, and uh, I, we've got other people working with us on it this time. Um, uh, the publishers made a, a very bad job of the last, the last edition, so bad. He said he really didn't want to do it anymore. We cajoled him in, into doing it. He's no longer on the bench. Um, he was a High Court judge while we were doing all this. Um, but uh, it, it was, a, it was a, a very fruitful um, collaboration between a, a practicing barrister, then judge, and an academic. Um, and I told him things he didn't know, and he, of course, knew quite a lot that I didn't. And, you know, the, the practicalities of how cases are likely to be handled in court and why they're likely to be handled in court in a certain way. Um, I think Professor Gareth Jones had a similar relationship with he did. Uh, Lord Right, Ruff. Ruff. that's right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's a very to come up for weekends. Yes. As well. Very fruitful partnership. Yes. Very um, interesting. Yeah. Very interesting to hear the background to that actually. <laughs> yes, well it's curious that there was Glanville in behind that one as well, really. It's a fascinating subject because it's such a mixture of common law and practice and procedure and some theory. And so topical. Yes. Fascinating, yep. actually. Yep. Absolutely fascinating. Mm. I've greatly enjoyed looking at some of your work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, mm. And I just based a few questions around the preface in the fourth edition, where on page five mention is made of the trust between judge and jury. Yes. And jurors mustn't know anything about prejudicial information not admitted at the trial. Yes. Um, what do you think is the solution to that, Professor Smith? I mean. Well, um, I think the courts have, in the last five years, with the assistance of Parliament, more or less solved it, we think. Um, what was very unclear five years ago was what the judges ought to say to juries in their, in their directions to them about the fact that there was prejudicial material available. And a lot of judges took the view that it was least said, soonest mended, best not to tell the jury anything about it. Then of course if the jury did go and find it for themselves um, and the judge doesn't find out about it, that's a pretty unsatisfactory situation and so the courts eventually um, in a series of cases took the view that the best thing to do was to, to, to broach it with the jury and say you know particularly in high profile cases with, um, uh, and explain to the jury why it was unfair to a defendant to take into account um, 
material that was not going to be actually discussed in the course of the case itself. That's the point about not being admissible. Um, you know, and they would have to say, look, it's not admissible for very good reasons. Um, you're not to take any notice of it. Your oath is to listen to the evidence that's put before you. It's simply unfair to the defendant to take into account material that may or may not be accurate, never been tested. You can't try him on the basis of that. You can only try on the basis of the evidence. And my judge friends say, once you explain that to the jury, um, you, 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 they will do what they what they have sworn to do. Um, we're reasonably confident that they'll do that. And the European Court, and there have been a number of cases that, that, have, that have gone to the European Court of Human Rights now, and the stance that they take is, well, you have to look at the composition of the court, and the court is the judge and the jury, and um, if the jury are directed properly not to take into account material that's not before them, you, unless you've got evidence to show that they have done that, that they have taken into account, you have to proceed on the basis that they haven't. Um, you can't proceed on the basis that there has been a lot of prejudicial information out there and the jury might have taken it into account unless there's evidence that they, some evidence they, they actually were aware of it and might have been acting on it. Yeah. I think so, you cite the case of Ali in that regard. Yes, that would be right. Yes. Um, that's one of the most recent ones. Yeah. Um, no, it's been quite fun actually. Um, I went to Bologna and Padua this year and gave a lecture on on contempt law. Um, they have no such institution um, at all. Um, and they were, there were two aspects of contempt. There is there is that aspect of it. Um, but the other aspect of it is that it um, is the mechanism that we use to ensure that court orders are complied with in civil cases. So it's relevant to um, family law disputes in particular and people have you know, the anti-molestation orders and things of that sort. So a breach of them is not just a breach of the order, it's actually a contempt of court. And of course, in Italy, um, court orders are dis disobeyed routinely. And uh, they said, well, you know, what do you do? And we said, we put people in prison. Um, if you, you know, we've got a very elaborate procedure, but a person who, in whose favour an order has been made can go to the court and say, this person has been ordered to do X, he or she hasn't done X, I now want you to put them in prison. Um, and the courts will. They do it a lot every day. Um, um, if you, you, can see, you can see it on the net these days because relatively recent, until relatively recently, a lot of these, particularly in family law cases, were not decided to hold in public. And the, the current Chief Justice said he was very uncomfortable about that. And he wanted it to, to uh, Alert the, not wanted litigants to alert the press or the courts to alert the press that a an imprisonable contempt might have been committed, and so the, the press is now more or less free to go along and see what's what's happening. And how do the courts in this country deal with treating during a hearing? That's that's okay. There are rules about it now. Um, I, I think they've said. Uh, I think the situation is that if a judge wants to tell um, journalists not to, he's got 10 minutes, I think that's the rule now, to say, you know, you're not to tweet that, please. Um, and a and journalist wouldn't, right. told not to. Yes. And I think that's the position, though. Yes. Once, it's, once it's been heard in open court, um, it, it must it's, it's reportable, but I think because of the fact that it can be done so quickly now, they, they, they do have a, a short limit. I think that's how it works. Yes. Yeah. Um, mm. Something else that's very interesting that you highlight is this sort of um, clash of jurisdictions around parliamentary privilege. Oh, yes. Um, you used to name people in court and cases in the House of Commons, uh, which obviously doesn't fall under the province of the courts. Yes. Um, but falls under the Privilege Committee. Yes. Can you see this becoming, do you see this as be, possibly becoming quite a serious issue? No, I don't think so. I think that um, when persons have violated um, the, uh, the rule 
course, by um, hiding themselves under the cloak of parliamentary privilege by identifying somebody in Parliament when there's an order not to. I think that's taken very seriously by the Privileges Committee. I think um, it, it's regarded, or it can be regarded, un unless there were very, very good reasons for it, as a, 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 a breach of parliamentary privilege. Um, so I, I don't think it's a problem. A problem. No. Coming then to one of the reviewers, John Laws, in the Law Quarterly Review. My successor, of course, is the Arthur Goodhart. I didn't realise that. Yes, yes. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, he was very commending. He said the book has the highest standard of scholarship. And he also said that it's a practitioner's textbook. Was it written as such? Not quite. Um, but I can see why he might have thought so. Um, and I think that's the, that's the um, combination of a, a practitioner like Sir David and, and an academic. And so I would say it's a treatise rather than a textbook. Um, uh, textbook has the notion, connotation really, something for students. I mean, he might say it's for, for practitioners. I might say that he um, he was in practice the Treasury uh, Devil, as they're called, um, and they he would have, he had done quite a lot of work on contempt and had written a very good article on contempt. So it was something he himself had a, an, an interest in, a real interest. Yes. Uh, when the book appeared, the uh, Human Rights Act was about to come into force and Laws said that your treating the subject was one of its strengths, particularly with regard to the law of contempt. He hoped that judges would regard the convention as symbiotic with the common law and not just an, ad, an alien add-on. Yes. Um, do, do you think that this wish has been fulfilled? Yes, yes, absolutely. And they take it into account um, on a routine basis. Oh. Yep, and Brexit will make no difference to that. Right. Um, Convention is completely different. Um, it comes from Strasbourg. Um, that's where the, the court is. Um, we we became members of that in, in the 1950s. Um, the first president was a uh, member of the faculty here, Lord McNair. Was the, was the first president of the European Court right. of Human Rights. Very interesting. Yeah. That was a long time ago, as I say, and yes. it was really, it was really, you know, it came out of the ashes of the Second World War. Yes. It really yeah. did. Mm. That brings us to your supplement. There have been two supplements to yes. this work. Yes. And the second, the, I mean, they were produced, obviously, as a result of reforms to the legislation that, uh, following the Law yes. Commission reports. Yes, yes. Um, and this summarises in, in the extended preface. Yes. You mentioned in the second supplement that, apropos televised court proceedings, there'd been some cases in New Zealand where the experience hadn't been that good. Yes. Could you say how this might affect the discussion in this country? Um, yes. Uh, there has actually been a, a review conducted um, at the behest of the Chief Justice as to how um, the televising the proceedings in New Zealand was um, was working. Um, I think, I mean, I know a judge who had to decide, one of my oldest friends had to, had to hear a case which was one of the highest profile cases um, New Zealand's ever had and he had huge trouble with the council, um, never mind witnesses. And it just, he, he said it just stopped you from concentrating on what was important. And it was a high, very high profile retrial of a man who had been convicted of killing three members of his family. This conviction was quashed by the Privy Council, um, Lord Bingham. And there was a lot of controversy about it. Um, <laughs> the Solicitor General of New Zealand thought that in quashing the conviction, the Privy Council directed that there should be a retrial. But I can remember Lord Bingham came to New Zealand and I picked him up at the airport. Um, and as we were driving in, in, he said, what's happened to that Bain case? Um, and I said, well, they're about to retry him. And he said, why? I said, because you told us to. And he said, no, I didn't. <laughs> it's not what I meant at all. Um, 
So anyway, it was, so it was, it was full of those kinds of difficulties already. Now the fact that you've then got a, you know, a, um, a camera crew in there um, just made the job a great deal more difficult. But other, other judges I've spoken to, um, particularly if they're not cases of any great um, notoriety, I mean, what, what the press would, t would tend to do, they're, they're quite constrained as to what they can do. They can only film for the first 10 minutes or, and so forth, but they will somehow they will manage to find a witness looking strained or a defendant looking remorseful or whatever, and, or, or the other thing, um, looking extremely cocky. Um, and that's the pictures you see in the press. <laughs> um, so I, I think that the, the, other, the conclusion that they came to was that there were, I think, um, some bits and pieces that needed tidying up and a little bit of thinking to be done, but um, ultimately um, uh, I don't think it'll affect the, the debate here. Um, as you probably know, the, the Supreme Court is now live-streamed. Do you know that? You, you can yes. just watch it you know, as it occurs. Yes. And I don't think there'd be any difficulty about doing that in the Court of Appeal either. It's the cases where you've got jurors and witnesses and so forth. Right. That's, that can be problematic. I understand. There's also in the preface uh, um, a discussion about the, the possibility of judges being able to order taking down of websites during a trial to stop jurors knowing facts about yes. the case. Yes, yes. Do you have any comments on that? It, 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 the mentioned? recommendation wasn't carried forward. Oh. Um, and I think that that was because it, it looks too much like censorship by the courts and they, they really don't want to be placed in that situation. And it would be enough with the, the strong directions that, that they could control any damage that, you know, um, that prejudicial publicity might give rise to. I think that's the answer. Right. Yeah. But the judges have said in a number of contexts, you know, we're not censors. Um, we don't want to be put in the position of censoring, certainly not in advance. Right. And, you know, you, one could also not imagine such a situation in the United States where there's more emphasis on the, you know, the Constitution. Yes. Yes, there was one, one, something in, 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 in the question you asked um, where the Americans do allow a great deal of highly prejudicial information, um, but of course, penalty they pay for that is having a very, very complicated jury selection system. Uh, it can take weeks to impanel a jury um, because they, uh, the counsellor are allowed to ask jurors questions about their approach to you know, this particular trial, about their approach to the death penalty, um, all those kinds of, I mean, books are written about how you go about impanelling a jury. Um, and uh, um, I think that's a, that's a route that we're just not at all happy about even thinking about going down, really. Yeah. Yes. Um, Professor Smith, on the question of journalistic freedom of expression and the protection of journalistic sources, uh, page 8, uh, actually page 13, says that barristers have a freedom of expression even in cases in which they are instructed to act. Yes, uh, yes. I mean, there's been a bit of a change there. The, the, the older rule was that barristers would not comment at all on the cases in which they've been instructed. Um, I think there was a there was a bar council rule to that effect. Um, now that's been that's been weakened, but you'll very rarely find a barrister commenting on on a case in which he or she's involved. Very rare. Um, solicitors will do it rather more rather more routinely. trying to think of cases in which that might have been done under the new dispensation, but I, I can't think of any of that really. Right. Yeah. In the uh, summing up of the, in the preface, you say that the most outstanding problems requiring attention of Parliament are related to public funding, available yes. to all those who are alleged to be yes. contempt. Yes, yes. And I think, that, I think that has been addressed to a certain extent. Um, well, certainly, there have been new measures to deal with it, and I think that the 
situation has been clarified. I think, I think our problem was that it was very difficult to tell when legal aid was or wasn't available. I think that was our real problem. Right. And I think that that's been, I'm not actually writing that bit of the book, uh, someone else is at the moment, but I think the answer is that that's now been clarified rather. Yeah. Which brings us to a paper that was published last year in the Criminal Law Review, right. Repositioning the Law of Contempt, Criminal Justice and Courts Act 2015. And here the whole question of juries having or not to give reason for verdicts in order to comply with Article 6 uh, is uh, highlighted. Uh, uh, my question would be, you know, surely the answer to why did you find him guilty is that or we think he did it, um, but that's obviously not good enough. Well, the, uh, um, I, I think that what was at issue there was a, a case in the European Court of Human Rights which was looking into the jury system which appeared at one stage to be moving in the direction of saying that it was a, was a violation of, I think, Article 6, if, the, if reasons weren't given. But the, but that, the court never actually made that decision. So even now, um, jurors aren't expected to give any, any answer other than guilty or not guilty. Right. Um, what has happened here and in New Zealand is that judges are now um, giving much, much more specific directions and they actually, I think it's called a jury trail or something like that, and they actually say there are several issues that you have to decide. This is issue number one. If you decide it as A, then this arises. If you decide it as B, this arises. And then they'll go th through the, the trail for the jury, so that they've got a, a, a trail to work through. Right. And I think that that's... that's um, in the old days, there was what was known as a special verdict, and the judges would ask the jurors to come back with a finding on this issue, this issue, this issue, this issue, and this issue. Um, uh, this is a kind of modified version of it, that the judges don't expect an answer on each of these questions, because what they'll eventually get to is, and if you've done all of that, all of that, if the conclusion you come to is X, then it's guilty, if the conclusion you come to is Y, then it's not guilty, and that's that's your part of the process completed, yes. yes. Mm. So, uh, apropos a juror disclosing information after discharge from jury service, with these new regulations, would it now be illegal for an ex-juror to ask to seek advice from a lawyer, given that uh, you, you're, he or she or he should go to the police or the trial judge in the first instance? Yes. It probably would be dangerous, and I think if they were to approach a lawyer, the lawyer would say, you, best, you know, you really must go to um, yeah. the court or, yes, yes. But I, I, you know, it could easily be done um, from with the best of intentions, I would have thought. Um, uh, so, it's something we've got to be, got to be careful about, certainly. Right. Yeah. And then finally, you conclude that the Criminal Justice and Courts Act does tackle the problem of what you call the unstoppable, unregulated information flow on the internet. You say it does this with remarkable energy and sure-footedness. Um, should there not be a, a, a rethink about what should be classified as prohibited information in the criminal justice system, rather than just how to stop it? Well, that would take you into uh, the law of evidence in a quite um, drastic way. Um, you, you know, you've got bad character evidence, you've got similar fact evidence, all of that sort of thing would need to be rethought. Um, and I think it's enough for the jury's purposes to know that um, there are particular facts about which they might be aware, but which cannot be used because it's too prejudicial, it's not probative enough. They don't even need to know that, it's just the law says we're not allowed to use it, yes. and so you mustn't use it. Um, and that's probably as far as you can take that argument, I would have thought. Right. Mm. Professor Smith, finally, you're uh, learning the law. Yes. The first edition with which you were involved was the 12th in yes. 2002. Yeah. And um, how did you bring it up to date from the 11th edition in 1982? Yeah. 20 years of change. Yes. Were there sort of major alterations that you had to Yes, there were. Them? Yes. Um, and one or two reviewers um, 
no, actually, somebody who was writing about it online was very critical, but um, there were, uh, I think, t two major changes. One was the masculine language in which the whole book was couched. It was aggressively masculine. Um, and you know, um, it felt very strange to a, the modern ear at, at, at that time. And of course, the, the number of women studying law has gone up and up and up. Um, so uh, I changed that tone completely. Um, the, other, the other thing, there were two other things. One was the, was the availability of materials through computing. Um, that was, uh, when did I do that? When did I do that? You, the 12th in 2002 was the first right. that you were involved in. Right. And then you brought it up to date from its 11th edition. That was in, 80, in 80, 1982. Um, that was Glanville's last edition. That was his last. Yes, that's yes. right. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, so uh, that uh, meant that I had to write about um, computer use and the way in which um, databases and so forth were going to change legal education quite significantly. Um, so that had to be catered for it still, still um, worries me how much of all of that to put in. Um, and then the third uh, element was um, the European dimension. Um, I put in a chapter on Europe. Uh, now I'm halfway through the correcting the proofs of a new edition. Wonderful. But it's not really because Brexit's rather <laughs> made a bit of a problem <laughs> With the, um, the, the, the half of the European chapter, half of it's on the European Union, the other half is on the convention. So the convention stuff is fine. That's the head character was saying. Yeah. But what I've had to say is, look, in the preface, really, um, what we uh, don't know is how long it's going to take us to exit all this. Even after we've exited, it may well be that you're going to need to know something about this because of the impact that it's had on. On the common law, um, and it has. Um, so that's that's the way I've, I've dealt with it. I'm not very happy about doing that, and I'm going through the proofs at the moment um, because there are other places where Europe is mentioned. For example, in this, in the chapter on the, on the courts, where I say that the European Court of Justice is, in some ways, on matters of European law anyway, the Supreme Court in our the jurisdiction now. Um, and I need to put in well until Brexit takes place. Yes. That will be the case. Yes. Um, but I, because of the availability of of, of um, legal materials, there's a very interesting case, a privacy case, held um, in the Supreme Court, um, where a man wanted to publish a book about his own life including the fact that he'd been abused as a small child, very, very badly abused. And he wanted to write about it, and his ex-wife got an injunction preventing him on the basis that it would do damage um, to their, um, their child, who was only about 10, I think, but who had already had um, considerable mental health difficulties. And the um, Court of Appeal, found in favour of the wife, um, the ex-wife, and so he, he was not allowed to publish, and the Supreme Court said, yes, he can publish, um, taking into account Article 10 of the European Convention and so on and so forth. And so what I've actually done, and I don't know whether it's a good idea, is said, look, to have a look at this case, um, all you've got to do is, is put this little citation into Google, and you'll have the text of the of the judgment in the Supreme Court. Why don't you have a look at it and see if that sort of thing interests you? And so I'm putting that in the preface. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a, I'm slightly worried about it because of the, uh, the language that, that even Lady Hale, Brenda Hale, uses, um, which she's taken from the, the book, um, is very graphic. So I thought, well, you know, these kids are going to encounter this. Um, the reason I've done it is that. In the chapter on uh, the ratio de sidendi, 
Glenwood had used a very old case, Wilkinson and Dalton, and it was a case in which a man told a woman that her husband had been seriously injured, and as a result of that, she suffered um, nervous shock. Um, and um, the, the case went in her favour. She won damages for nervous shock as a result of being told um, by this pr prankster um, that her husband had been hurt. Now, the, the Supreme Court actually relies on that decision in the, in the case that I've just been mentioning, that um, Wilkinson and Dalton. So it, it sort of brings it up to date in a way. Um, it shows that when they're looking at how you find the ratio, that's it in either case, seeing how it works through into later cases. Here's a, another example of it. Um, so. Uh, is, is this case pending, Professor Stanley? No, no, the, the, the Supreme Court has held in favour of this, the father. Right. Yep, and allowed him to publish it. I think it has not been published. Right. Yep. And it's, it's fair to say that, uh, that although the parties were at loggerheads about it, they seem to have been uh, reconciled about it in the sense that uh, the mother was not claiming that he was doing it deliberately to hurt the boy, or, um, just that you know, she was worried that um, he, he was suffering from all kinds of mental difficulties. Um, she was worried that it would exacerbate them helped, I think, by the fact that she was American and she had gone back to America with the boy, so that he might not have you know, necessarily seen the book. But you, you, know, you have to look at the graphic language that's used in it to see just why she would have been all worried. So it is an example of you know, the European Convention yes. uh, kicking in. Mm. Mm. Well, Professor Smith, all that remains for me to thank you very much indeed for yet another mm. truly fascinating account. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to adding this to our archive. It's going to be very valuable and greatly appreciated by your many friends and colleagues well, thank you. here in the Law Faculty mm -hmm. and indeed worldwide. <laughs> thank you very, very much. Well, thank you, yes. yes. Well, thank you for all the work you put into it, obviously. Yeah. Well, honestly, it's long. been such a pleasure. I, really, I've so enjoyed talking to you and looking at your some of the issues which mm -hmm. which you've grappled over mm -hmm. all these years. Quite a long time, yes. Truly <laughs> fascinating. Well thank you. Really yeah. truly yeah. thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I once in the eighties drove into Cape Town and encountered a march, a protest march from the townships and it was the most awful experience to be in the car and know if anything went wrong, the police wouldn't know how best to handle it. Mm -hmm. Well I actually yeah. gave some advice to the Irish um, when they were doing a, um, a review of the law governing you know, marching in the parades in, in Northern Ireland. Um, there was quite a major report on it, um, the North Report. And um, they, they, they set up something called a Parades Commission, right. which now regulates the, um, the holding of those marches. And, and you don't hear anything like as much as you used to. Yeah. You know, they used to go marching into one another's territories and always finished up in jolly great riots. It happened every year. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but about, apparently there were about 2,000 marches a year and, right. and, and they were just provocative. <laughs>